Hi there, I'm Jen, this is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a reading wrap-up of the past couple of weeks of reading that doesn't include the books that I read for the Latinxathon. Because one of the things that I was reading that I mentioned in the other video was poetry, I picked up a few other poetry collections, the first of which was Vikram Seth's Summer Requiem, which is a series of poems that were written over, I think, a span of 20 years, all of which touch on the changing of seasons, uh, which is a fairly standard theme when it comes to poetry. So that doesn't sound super inspiring necessarily, but I thought what was interesting in this in terms of modern poetry, especially by authors who are known for their literary fiction, is that this is very traditionally structured poetry with very strong rhyme to most of it. So it wasn't necessarily the style that I would like, but I think for people who are upset when they see free verse type things and no rhyming structure, and would like their poetry to be more straightforward than I think a lot of more modern poetry is, I think this might be right up your alley. To give you a feel of the straightforwardness of the poetry, I will read from Evening Scene from My Table. Evening is here, and I am here, at my baize table with a glass, now sipping my unfizzy beer, now looking out where on the grass. Two striped and crested hoopoes glean, delicious insects one by one, a barbet flies into the scene, across the smoky city sun. My friends have left, and I can see no one, and no one will appear. This must be happiness, to be sitting alone with birds and beer. In a brief while the sun will go, and grand unnerving bats will fly, westward in clumped formations slow, and dark across a darkened sky. So, if that is your style of poetry, that might interest you more than it interested me. It was a little too... It wasn't really my style of poetry, but if you enjoy that style of rhythm and nature imagery, there you go. Next up I picked up Ocean Vuong's Night Sky with Exit Wounds. I had read his novel On, er On Earth Were Briefly Gorgeous a couple months ago, and I quite enjoyed that, although uh, not everyone did. That was one that got quite a few mixed reviews. This overall has been much better reviewed and more uniformly praised than the novel was. However, for me, I wasn't as enthralled by this, although it does touch on a lot of very similar topics to the novel, and the novel was very poetic, so some of the rhythm of the language is very similar. So I think maybe that's why I, it didn't seem so striking to me, because I think people who read this first, it was more of a revelation at that point. I mean, that said, I still quite enjoyed this. I think I gave this five stars on Goodreads, which I don't give a lot of books that. I'll read one of the poems. This is Thanksgiving 2006. Brooklyn's too cold tonight, and all my friends are three years away. My mother said I could be anything I wanted, but I chose to live. On the stoop of an old brownstone, a cigarette flares, then fades. I walk to it, a razor, sharpened with silence, his jawline etched in smoke. The mouth where I re-enter this city, stranger, palpable echo, here is my hand, filled with blood, thin as a widow's tears. I am ready. I am ready to be every animal you leave behind." So that is the kind of language that this uses. Similarly to his novel, touches on a lot of different topics ranging from family to love to immigration and all that. I thought this was great. If you read the novel and enjoyed it, or didn't enjoy it but thought it should have been <laughs> published as poetry instead, this would be probably right up your alley. And then to go to something significantly more straightforward, I picked up another one of Svetlana Alexievich's oral histories. This is La Guerre n'a pas un visage de femme. This was translated from Russian into French by Galia Ackerman, and the English translation of this is called The Unwomanly Face of War. When I had picked this up, I actually thought it was about female, female military experiences throughout the Soviet era. It's not. It's specifically about female military experiences during the Second World War. And similarly to Voices from Chernobyl, which I read earlier this year, it is essentially, and I think as is Alexievich's style of writing, it's a series of interviews in which her parts are cut out, so it seems like monologues from these various people. A lot of the sections in this are significantly shorter than the ones that were in Voices from Chernobyl, although there are some longer ones, uh, which is interesting because it gives voice to a wider variety of, of experiences. There are people who were actual members of the military, there are people who were nurses, there are people who were partisans, uh, there are people who were just family members who were at home and talking about what was happening and when people were starving, when people were repeatedly starving, when you, 
who were in a second round of kind of horror when you're talking about the Ukrainians who had been through this forced starvation earlier and then the war came. So it is in a lot of ways a litany of suffering. It is very depressing but at the same time it's it's a good thing to have a record of um, and she leaves in some of the comments where people say uh, you didn't used to be able to talk about that are we allowed to talk about that now which was interesting i mean you hear about the horrors that happened on the eastern front during the second world war and this certainly doesn't pull any punches when it comes to that kind of thing and i thought some of the really interesting parts were from women who had been part of the forces that went and then occupied germany at the end of the war and uh, those were some interesting stories as well. Definitely worthwhile, I would say. I think when you look at uh, Second World War histories that are written in, in English or in French, it tends to be much more focused on the Western Front when it comes to the European side of things. So this was something I hadn't heard a lot of stories from, so I thought that was quite interesting. So I found it quite educational in addition to the general interestingness of it. So I also read Alicia Elliott's A Mind Spread Out on the Ground. I had seen her speak on the Indigenous panel at the Festival of Literary Diversity back in May. I'll link to the video where I talked about that below. She I think was the youngest person on that panel so I immediately went and put her book on hold at the library and it took this many months for me to get it because it's been that popular. Uh, the title is basically an English translation of the Mohawk word for depression. And the essays in here deal are, some of them are memoir-esque, where she talks about her childhood. She's had an interesting upbringing in that her grandparents took her father to the United States so that he wouldn't have to go to residential schools. And there he met her mother, who is a white American woman. And when she was 12, they moved back to Canada and she grew up on the Six Nations Reserve. And so she talks a lot about the experience of kind of suburban poverty in the United States and then reserve experiences in Canada from a personal perspective but then she also talks about the broader social picture too and I think this was great because I think a lot of the people who are having these discussions are quite a bit older than she is there are certainly people writing straightforward memoirs and novels about it but this kind of essay mixture I think was especially interesting coming from someone under the age of 40-ish I would say and as the title of the book implies it, there's also quite a bit of discussion about mental illness her mother was bipolar she and her husband have both dealt with depression so that's kind of something that's hanging over the side of that and and the, the opening essay which is where the title comes from discusses the kind of cultural constructs around mental illness and i thought that was very interesting stuff if there's one negative that i would have about this is that when she talks about more distant history, I think there's sometimes a bit of mythologizing going on with that, which I think is both is understandable, but when it's presented as history, it broke the, the notion of where this was going just because adding the mythology into something that's so straightforward um, was slightly jarring. But aside from that, which was only in one of the essays, um, yeah, I thought this was great stuff and well worth picking up. I also read a graphic memoir called No Ivy League by Hazel Nulevant. This basically details the author's experience as a teenager when they had been homeschooled in a kind of hippie style, not in a religious style. And this details one particular summer in their life as a teenager in which they were both participating in a contest about the joys of homeschooling, but also working at a parks and recreation type job cleaning forests in which most of the other people were from at-risk families and it's basically about them coming to terms with the amount of privilege that they're dealing with and both what that means in terms of having been homeschooled and what exactly their parents were protecting them from in the greater world. So they go into a bit of the specific history of racial segregation or exclusion in the Pacific Northwestern United States and there's a bit about the family's personal history and how in a certain way the reason they were homeschooled is because their mother had negative school experiences but the mother blames that on busing which was part of desegregation so the author's teenage self is kind of appalled that they were homeschooled as a result of desegregation so they're trying to I'd like to say that they're trying to deal with that but they aren't it's kind of just it's exclusively this realization that 
the other people that they're working with have much more challenging lives in a lot of ways and that they've essentially been buffered from a certain amount of the reality of the rest of the world by virtue of having been homeschooled. Um, this has the problem that I've had with a lot of memoirs lately, uh, that I've had with a few other memoirs lately, which is that I don't think the author has given this enough time to marinate because they don't have any reflections on what it means to realize that they have this kind of baseline benefit over other people. It's just a realization that they have it, but not anything really deeper in terms of the meaning. So it's, I think the back of it describes it as, oh look, white privilege. Although I'd say it's both racial and cultural because some of the people that she works with are Russian immigrants. So it's not exclusively a, a racial thing as it's a cultural and class. Yeah, language, culture, class, and race. But there isn't really any discussion of it. It's like, well, here they realized this thing, they did some research, the end, and then it's the end of the summer. And they won the contest, which they decide then they made a propaganda video for it, which I'm sure is true to their experience. And the illustrations are nice, so that part of it was good, but it felt very empty because all it is is them having this realization and there's nothing deeper to it. So again, as with a few other memoirs I've read lately, I think if the author had given this a few more years, they could have come back and evaluated it more, but this is what we have, so I wasn't that impressed. As usual, I listened to a couple of audiobooks, both of which ended up being almost meditative, even though I was not expecting them to be. Uh, the first of which was Anne Bogle's I'd Rather Be Reading, The Delights and Dilemmas of the Reading Life. She is the blogger who, uh, whose blog was The Modern Mrs. Darcy, and a lot of this is lists lists of quotes, lists of places one could read, lists of ideas that are kind of at odds with each other in regards to book buying or library uses. Parts of it are an ode to the library that she had right next door for a number of years in the house that was uh, her first, I think the first house that she bought as an adult. And a lot of this was charming. Some of the lists don't really work in audio format. I definitely started zoning out on bits of them. But overall, I liked this quite a lot more than I thought I would. I downloaded this exclusively because it was on the Available Now page uh, at the library and it was exactly the right length, but I found it quite entertaining. I haven't read much of anything on her blog, so I wasn't really familiar with her before this, but I was reasonably entertained. And I would assume that if you read her blog, it would be more entertaining. And then I listened to another short audiobook, which is Gretchen Rubin's Outer Order, Inner Calm. Gretchen Rubin is the author of The Happiness Project and has that whole motivational thing. And I'm not normally a huge fan of that style of motivation writing, but I think what makes her more tolerable for me is that she's very practical in her ideas. This is sort of a decluttering book, but not which you know, is my favorite kind of self-help book. <laughs> but it almost takes the form of meditation, so I really liked it. Um, she does mention, like, the KonMari method and sparking joy, and she said, if you don't want to go for that, you can consider it from, do you love it, do you need it, and do you use it? Which, again, I think is practical. Her, as with a lot of her books, there's some of her specific examples are a little too specific, but I think if you extrapolate from there, they're fine. She narrated this herself, and she has a very relaxing voice, so I found it kind of relaxing to listen to her talking at me. As with the other one, there are bits that don't really keep your attention because it is kind of repetitive, but I was entertained and relaxed. It did not make me clean my house, though, so, you know, did it work? Not really. So it didn't really inspire me, but still, I enjoyed it. Anyway, those are the things that uh, I got through over the past couple of weeks. If you've read any of these, I'd love to hear what you thought about them. I'd also be curious to hear if you occasionally pick out audiobooks from the library just on the basis of how long they are, <laughs> because I'm sure I can't be the only person who does that. I bet a lot of people do. So anyway, let me know. We can, I was going to say commiserate, but it's not like it's a bad thing. We can share stories. Anyway, that's it for now. Ciao.